much. You'll be finding Matthew's Gospel, if you would. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10. We're also, as we close the message today, we're going to look at Malachi chapter 4. Uh, it's just a few pages back uh, from Matthew, and so you don't really have to put a finger there. When I get there, you just take a left, go a few pages, and you'll be right there in Ma Malachi chapter 4. Matthew chapter number 10. We have, during these days, been centered around uh, talking about seven life-changing words that can revolutionize your home. We have looked at the word love. We've looked at the word truth. Uh, we have looked at the word forgiveness. Many of you have asked about that message. I believe we can make some copies of that. If you would like to have that, you can pick it up or just let Mr. Tim know and he'll make you a copy. We also looked at the word church and how important, how vital church is in the life of a family. And then this morning, we're going to look at the word commitment. The word commitment. And I want to go ahead and say, as I told the early service from the outset of this message, this is a... A very difficult message because um, I, I'm still struggling with this and still trying to work it out in my own life and uh, how this applies to me. So uh, remember, each time we preach, we're preaching the ideal. We know we live in reality. And so there, there are things you say, well, preacher, you're supposed to have it all together. Preacher, you're supposed to uh, know what to do and teach us what to do. Well, I understand what you're saying, but, but I'm just like you. I live life just like you live. I try to raise kids. I try to be a husband. I try to be an uncle. Uh, I try to be a brother. And so we're on this journey together. And uh, there are things uh, that we'll struggle more with than other things. And today is one of those things that I'm still learning how to practice what I preach. So I want you to listen carefully this morning and I want you to make notes if you would. I believe it will be of a great benefit to you. Seven life-changing words that can re revolutionize your home. The word commitment. You know, it's costly uh, to have kids these days. According to a report from the USDA called expenditures on children by families. Uh, they said in 2009, now that's, uh, that's almost seven years ago, or it is seven years ago, but it says in 2009 it cost a middle class family over $200,000 to raise a child until the age of 17. Now you heard that right. $200,000 to raise a child until the age of 17. Now, that's very costly, but I want to tell you something this morning that is more costly, Christian, and it is even more costly to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I said a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. It, it is more costly. You see, according to Matthew, who was an eyewitness account to the life of the Lord Jesus, according to Matthew, being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ will cost you and cost me absolutely everything. If we're going to be committed to our kids, if we're going to be committed to our families and our church, then it's going to cost us something. But hear me this morning, it is a price that's worth paying. Amen? It's a price that absolutely is worth paying. The best way to change your family is to make your faith your number one priority. Amen. Individually, personally, if you want to change your family, and I've got news for you in here this morning. Some of us don't think that our families need changing. Oh, yes, they do. When you get down to brass tacks, there are some things that need to change in our families. And listen, it, it, the best way to change your family is to make your faith your number one priority. As a matter of fact, you remember uh, the challenge that Joshua gave to God's people before they were about to enter into the promised land. He's addressing the children of Israel. And he looks out over them in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. He said, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua, 
He's exhorting others to a binding, serious commitment. But he does not issue this challenge before he commits himself and before he commits his household to serving Jesus. Now, uh, we focus today on our fifth word of seven words that can radically and drastically change your home. Words that have the potential to revolutionize that home. And our word for today is the word commitment. Now, the word commit means to give in. Or to give charge to. It means to entrust or to put. Or I like the last one, to roll. Uh, The last uh, idea shows that instead of running our own lives, we're to roll everything over to Him. That's the way it's used in Psalm 37. In verse 5, the psalmist said, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. You see, your pastor this morning is of the conviction that if we want our families to change, then we need to fortify our faith by paying the price of total commitment to Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39, lay out two different dimensions of what complete commitment is all about. Two different dimensions of what complete commitment is all about. Stand with me as we read uh, these three verses, 37, 38, and 39. Jesus speaking. Now listen to me. This is a hard teaching. Verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You could put grandparent in there too if you want to. Grandfather, grandmother. It's not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. He that loves his son or his daughter, his boy, his girl, he that that loves them more than he loves me, I'm not worthy of him. He that loves grandson or granddaughter more than he loves me, is not worthy of me. And then look at verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Thank you, and you may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading and preaching of his word. Complete commitment. What is Christ talking about when he he lays out these dimensions of what complete commitment is? What, What is he talking about complete commitment? Well, a couple of things and then we'll finish with a third thing. But notice first of all, complete commitment, write this down, it speaks of a supreme love. Complete commitment speaks of of a supreme love. You see, we must love Jesus more than anyone else. That's what Christ is saying. We must love Jesus more. If we're going to be a fully devoted, a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must love Jesus more than anyone else, and that includes our family. Matter of fact, Jesus puts an emphasis on that. I mean, he doesn't say family. He says mother or father. He says son or daughter. We must love Jesus before anyone. We must love Jesus more than we love our children. We must love Jesus more than we love our spouse. We must love Jesus more than we love anybody else. Notice again verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. One pastor said this. He said, to allow our kids to mean more to us than our relationship with the Lord is to put them in grave danger. Why do you think that Abraham was asked to take his son Isaac up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice him unto the Lord? Listen very carefully this morning. God wanted Abraham to settle in his life that who he loved more. Abraham, do you love your son more or do you love your Savior more? We sing that song sometimes, uh, uh, Stacey and Harrison and Sadie sing, When I Lay My Isaac Down. Some of you don't get that song. But hear the chorus, hear the verse. God didn't want Isaac. God wanted me. 
God didn't want my son on the sacrificial altar. God wanted me. God wanted Abraham to settle who it is that he loved more, his son or his savior. Now, there are two extremes that we need to avoid when it comes to our family. Two extremes we need to avoid when it comes, if we're parents, uh, uh, when it comes to parenting our kids. First of all, here's the first extreme. We should never treat our family as nothing. We should never treat our family as nothing. One man called this the family straight dra- jacket. Family straight jacket. Where the family curtails what it is that we really want to do. That means our kids, our family. You know what? They put a cramp in our lifestyle or on our lifestyle. They hold us back. They hold me back. My kids hold me back from what I want to do. My kids hold me back from my ambitions, my goals. I mean, they're just getting in the way. Uh, That's what he's talking about here. In this view, kids are to be seen and not heard or maybe even not seen. You see, some parents see their kids. You say, no way, preacher. Oh, yes, listen. Some parents see their kids as a nuisance and will do whatever they can not to be around them. Now, I reminded the early service, and I I want to remind the second service, church is not a babysitter for our children. It's not a place that we bring them or send them just to get a couple of hours of relief from. Matter of fact, if you, have, if you have a child in the nursery, you ought to be on the list to stay in the nursery and help us minister to those babies and those preschoolers. Amen. Grandparents too. Our children are not nuisances. They are a gift from God and we must never take them for granted and we should never treat them as nothing. But here's the other extreme. Not only should we not treat family as nothing, but listen to me, we should never treat family as everything. Now here's where it's going to get real quiet. Here's here's what I'm talking about that I still struggle with day by day. But we must not treat our family as everything. It does our family and it does our children no favors when they come before Jesus in our lives. If the sin of parents a while ago was to ignore their family, then today's sin is to make our children our first focus. A writer by the name of Kevin DeYoung, you know what he calls this? He calls it kindergarten. Not matriarchy, not patriarchy. We no longer have matriarchy or patriarchy in our homes. We have a kindergarten. Listen to me this morning. We're not doing our kids any favor when they think they are the center and circumference of everything. When they think they are the center of our attention and when they think that all the world revolves around them, we're not doing them any favors. There are too many of us as parents who were or who have become, listen to me, We've become child-centered instead of Christ-centered. Now, young people, I'm not putting you on the back burner. I'm going to get to it in a moment. I'm not putting you on the back burner. Just preaching the Word of God. Amen? Amen. An overemphasis on family can rob us of faith. But there's something else that can get us into trouble, and that very thing is ourselves. So we are to love Christ more than those closest to us. And we are to love Jesus more than we love our own life. Complete commitment speaks of a supreme love. I must love Jesus more than I love anybody else. That includes my wife. That includes my boy. That includes my girl. I love Jesus most. But second of all, complete commitment speaks of a sacrificial love. It speaks of a sacrificial love. We must totally lose our life and totally follow Jesus. We lose our life in time. Now, don't turn me off after that, this first point. Some of you are already, you're going to write me a letter, send me an email, you're going to catch me after the service and say, I'm not sure about that preacher. Don't turn me off after that first point because we need to get this second point. Cross bearers are called to follow the crucified one. Discipleship is demanding because we're called to die to ourselves. Now, in our day, the cross has been decorated. In our day, the cross has been romanticized. I mean, we wear the cross around our neck. I do it. Uh, uh, It's a trinket to us. It's an ornament. Uh, Something we wear around our neck or place upon our walls or atop the church building. Do you know how when we reference this verse, most of us, when we reference uh, verse 37 and 38, we say something like this. Here it is. And he that taketh not his cross 
and follow after me is not worthy of me. Here's what we do. We say, well, everybody's got their cross to bear. And normally when we say that, we're talking about putting up with our boss, dealing with our unruly children, dealing with our in-laws. When we say it, we may be talking about the trouble we have with ingrown toenails or a constant upset stomach or some other illness that seems to plague us all the time. And we just say, well, everybody's got their cross to bear. But hear me this morning, friend. The cross in Christ's day was only carried by condemned criminals and it ended with a humiliating, excruciating execution. You see, every man that walked up the street carrying that cross, he knew it was a death march. I mean, he was saying goodbye to everything and everyone. There was no turning back. He was saying goodbye to it all. So friend, when we lose that which has always been so important to us, we end up finding that which we've been searching for all along. Uh, speaking of those who are completely committed to Christ, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, here's what John says. He says, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. It means when it, when it got right down to it and they were, facing the, uh, they were facing death, they were facing the guillotine, they were facing the chopping block, they were facing the firing squad, they loved Jesus Christ so much, even if it meant leaving their families behind, they would give their life for the faith. You see, commitment to loving Jesus hits at the very heart of human relationships to make sure that following Christ comes first. We as believers, man, if we're serious about being a fully devoted follower of Christ, then we lay aside our goals. We lay aside our ambitions. We lay aside our very life to do what He wants us to do and to go where He wants us to go. Now here's where the rubber meets the road. It's easy to be a fan of Jesus on Sunday. I mean, we can even tag him as a friend on Facebook. I mean, it's easy to follow Jesus on Twitter. Put a picture of him up on Instagram. I mean, the church is full of fans. This church is full of fans of Jesus. We cheer for him on Sunday, but after the game is over, we go back to our life and wait for the next game to come around to cheer for him again. I mean, we're fans of Jesus. Could I ask you something this morning, sir, ma'am, teenager? Are you willing to renounce every person, every possession, and especially yourself in order to follow Jesus Christ? Will I put my faith over my family and over anything else that has been first in my life? What is it that is keeping me from following Him fully? Dietrich Bonhoeffer made this statement, and I want you to listen very carefully. He said, We live in a time of cheap grace and easy believism where Christianity is more identified with health and wealth than with sacrifice and service. Luke's account, if you're familiar with Luke's account of this record, in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, Luke. Luke points out something specific. Luke says, while Jesus is doing this teaching, or before he was doing this teaching, uh, Luke says that large crowds were traveling with Jesus. But when they heard these words, when they heard this teaching from the lips of our Lord, the crowd dissipates very quickly. No longer do the crowds follow Him. Uh, kind of like many will do this morning, they will dismiss this message because it calls for too much from us. It's a hard saying. It's a hard teaching. But listen to me. Jesus does not lower the bar just because we don't like it. Commitment to Him is costly. Discipleship is demanding. But hear me this morning. When we settle the surrender issue and we commit to follow Christ at any cost, then our family will be in the right focus. That's the secret to achieving the first point. That supreme, that supreme commitment. Jesus first, and then family will be loved right. A man by the name of Andrew Ferguson made this statement. He said, you fulfill yourself by denying yourself, preparing the people you can't live without to live without you. 
So here's what we've talked about. We must supremely, supremely love Jesus more than anybody else. We must sacrificially lose our life and follow Christ. Now there's no doubt. That these calls to commitment from Jesus, no doubt, they're extremely costly. But they must be followed if we're going to be the parent, if we're going to be the family member God wants us to be. Matter of fact, if I love Jesus like I ought to love Jesus, I'm going to love my nephews and my niece like I ought to love them. I'm going to love my wife like I should love them. I'm going to love my son and my daughter like I ought to love them if I love Jesus supremely. But complete commitment speaks of a last thing. It speaks of a singular love. A singular love. You see, when Jesus has your heart, listen, everybody look at me. When Jesus has your heart, He'll turn it toward your home. He'll turn it toward your home. Flip to Malachi. Just, just flip over a few pages to the left. Just a few pages to the left. Malachi. Speaking of Elijah. And, and, and the ministry of Elijah was actually fulfilled by John the Baptist in the Gospels. Here's what he said of the coming, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He said, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. There is a sense in which you hear the heart of God here. I mean, there's a longing for the day when houses are transformed into homes. Now notice with me what Malachi says. He says he's talking about God. Only God can change a human heart. And it's the heart that is the issue. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 19. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. The implication in Malachi chapter 4 is that a change needs to take place. He says, turn their hearts. Friend, turning implies that there is a change that needs to take place. And the key to this turning, the key to this change is the Father. It applies to all parents. It applies to the grandmother, the grandfather. It, it applies to everybody. But daddy's the key. Daddy's the key. But listen, children, young people, they also need to pray that their hearts will soften toward their parents. You have no idea, church, how many young people, even adults, that I counsel with who have grown cold, unforgiving, whatever you want to call it. They've grown calloused toward a mama or toward a daddy. For whatever reason, they've just grown, grown cold. They're, they're unforgiving toward them. Listen, we need to pray that children, children will soften their hearts toward their parents. I, I wonder why this verse is recorded in the last book of the last chapter of the Old Testament. I mean, this is God's last word. For 400 years before the Gospels come on the scene. You see, the heart of God is that my heart might be for my children and that my children's heart might be for me. My heart for my family and my family's heart for me. But that can only happen if my heart is for God first. C could I implore you this morning? Can I implore you this morning? If there are parents here today, or a parent here today, and you feel as though, and you would never admit this to anybody, you've never told anybody this, but you feel as though your heart has grown cold, or grown weary of parenting, I mean, the daily grind of trying to keep them in line, the daily grind of keeping up with what they should be keeping up with, the daily grind of, of trying to make them behave, the daily grind of trying to, to make that baby stop crying and stay up all night. You've never told anybody and you never would, but your heart has grown weary of parenting. You think your kids don't have much to do with you? Listen, if, if that's your state, if that's how you feel, make this verse your life verse from this point on. Malachi 4.6. Make it your life verse. 
Ask God to turn your heart to your children and ask Him to turn their hearts toward you. I believe with all of my heart that God wants to answer prayers like that. I, I'm going to close with this. But I was thinking about, last night I was thinking about Leslie over there at the hospital. Terry's been by her side. Amy's been there. Scott goes. I thought about myself. Last year's been the hardest year of my life, but I thought through it all. Stacy, Sadie, Harrison, my mom and dad, my, my family, my, my nephews and my niece, uh, both sides. They've been there with me through thick and thin during my time of trouble. Uh, there are some, uh, some men in here today who, who have called me or texted me or checked on me every day. You know what? That's family. Not only, not only did, did uh, these that I just mentioned, not only did they have family, but they also had another family, and that's you. You. I, I've seen the cards. I've heard the calls. I've seen the Facebook post to some of those in our congregation who have been sick. I, I've seen it. Like I said, there are some men in this church who called me every day or text me every day. They wrote me letters. Friend, that's family. But there are others in our fellowship right now who need their church family. They need a word of encouragement. They, they need a meal. They need some help. And listen, these are people who love their families and their families love them. But even more than that, they seem to love Jesus more than anybody else. And because God has their hearts, He's turned the heart of their family toward them. So here's the application. What's holding you back this morning from full commitment to Jesus Christ? What's keeping me from following Him fully? What has a hold on my heart? What's holding you back from full commitment to your family? Is it time for a heart change? Maybe, maybe there are some parents in here today who, who need to ask God to turn their hearts toward their home. What do you need to say no to that has been taking you away from your family? How about making a recommitment to your faith and to your family? You know what? Some of us need to, We just need to go out and eat together. Some of us just need to sit around the table with our family and have a meal. I've got another novel idea. Why don't you come to church together and worship together? Sometimes, young people, I, I don't want you sitting down, on the, on, down front. I want you to sit with your parents. Worship together. Sunday should be a family day, but only after it's been God's day. Say amen. Some of us work all week. We get home late. We do what we want to do. We tuck our kids into bed and we go through all week like that. And then we tell the Lord on Sunday that we need time with our family. When what we really need is to get our priorities in order. Will you pay the price? You know, I don't think it's too much. You may and most do. I don't think it's too much to give Jesus a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. At the most, three hours. Commitment. Old adage you've heard all your life, most of us, joy. Jesus first. That's verse 37. Others second, including our family. Yourself last. Lose your life and you'll find it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.